I'm Lourdes Lopez. I'm the executive director of Morphosis The Wilden Company. A big highlight in my dancing career probably would, would have been the when I was promoted to soloist because um, I never really thought that I would get into New York City Ballet. I just thought that I just wasn't the type to get in. And once, once I got in there into the core, there's this real sense that that's, that that's where most people stay. And, and I never quite felt like a real Balanchine dancer for some reason. So for him to have promoted me to a soloist, to me it meant that there was really hope that I could actually at one point become a principal. So I think when I look back, I think those were one of the most, that day was one of the most, um, you know, uh, personally fulfilling days for me. And, and there's an interesting, I always remember when I went up to him to thank him, it was during the Nutcracker season, I went up to him backstage, it was after performance, and I said, you know, I just found out that I was promoted and I want to thank you and I never, you know, you do the, the usual, I never thought I would get it and, you know, and all of this. And he looked at me and he said, you know, dear, I didn't do the work you did. So don't congratulate me, and and that to me was was um, was incredible because he moved he moved the the gift of of the promotion that came from him he he gave it back to me he which he kind of empowered the dancer to realize that you're being promoted because you've put a lot of work into this art form period end of story not because of and I just thought it's an interesting it was an interesting comment from him because most. Most of the time you get the director say, you're welcome, you're welcome, I'm seem so happy for you, it'll be fun. You never ever hear anybody saying, why are you thanking me? You did the work, I didn't. Was he possessive about uh, dance, about ballet? Yes, he was. To him, it really he was an, uh, an incredibly spiritual man and a, and a mystical man. And I think he, he viewed ballet and dance as a religion. So you didn't walk on the stage in your shoes. Um, you know, you, don't, you didn't throw the costumes on the floor. Um, you were respectful to the musicians, the wardrobe mistresses, to everybody that allowed you to dance that night, you were respectful to. And he was the first one that said that. Was he possessive about his dancers? Um, when I got in, he, it was towards the end of his life. It was like the last 14 years of his life. So I didn't quite see that much, but I understood how he could, could be because he, he, he felt this, this was his family. He was possessive, I think like a parent was possessive. And I think um, his kind of, I think for him it worked because it wasn't you have to wear this and act this and you had to, um, it was keeping you on track to make sure that you were moving in the direction that you wanted to move into. I think that was his possessiveness. Um, and you know the other great thing about him is that there was no ego. I mean, even with Mr. Balanchine, you 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 walked into that theater and you left your ego behind because it wasn't about you. It wasn't about him. It was about this art form, and you had to have that kind of dedication and focus to it, um, or else why kind of why do it? I think Balanchine understood that no matter how talented he was, when the curtain went up, if there wasn't a dancer dancing his choreography, or somebody else's choreography for that matter, there's no reason. I mean, Balanchine's choreography lived in his head. Robin's choreography lives in his, lived in his head. Christopher's choreography lives in his head. They need, the, they need the instrument to kind of, to make it happen. And I think that's why Balanchine ultimately was really so respectful of dancers, and he really was. He absolutely really was because he understood he was just defeating himself by yelling and screaming and, and being a jerk. Um, it, it didn't, it didn't um, you know, it, he didn't benefit from it. There was no benefit to that. Um, and then I think also he was just, he was a gentleman. He was a gentleman and, and like I said, he, I mean I, I saw him get mad at a dancer because she put her costume on the floor and he took her by the hand, went downstairs and said, do you see these women with glasses on hunching over sewing machines? They're, they're here every day to make you look pretty at night. And, and it was those kind of messages that you realize that it was all a, a community that you couldn't function without him and he couldn't function without you and neither one could function without the seamstress and you couldn't function without the musician and, and the state and you know it was all this one um, kind of community and I think that has uh, for some reason maybe changed a little bit we don't we don't quite understand it as well maybe because we move around so much I don't know
The biggest differences between when I was there and today, I think, I think that when the dancers that were there were there for a reason when I was there. And we were there to dance, we were there for balancing. Um, and you saw very little turnover, hardly any turnover in terms of dancers. Because you were at the forefront of something happening and you couldn't go anywhere that was really any better. And I'm not so sure that that's really understood at this point, you know, with City Ballet, once you lose that founding father, um, the organizations do need to change and they do need to kind of morph into something else. Not necessarily that it's better or worse, but they just have to morph and change into, into another organization or another um, institution. When I was there at City Ballet, it wasn't, um, it was not, it had some bureaucracy, but it was not an institution. It was still an arts organization. I think dancers, I think there has, there's been a whole cultural change. You know, in other words, my generation versus your generation, very different human beings, very different information. I, you know, I, my information was from a library. Uh, your information is at the, you know, in a nanosecond, you can get any, in, any information you want. So there's a whole, the world has opened up. The world to, for you has become smaller. And the world for me, when I was growing up, was larger. So you, it's hard to, it's hard to fit those dancers into the past and today's dancers or the past dancers into the future. I think, I think dance is going through a very interesting, I think classical ballet is going through a very interesting change in terms of its dancers and its um, companies. I think dancers are becoming more mobile. I think they're not, um, they're not married uh, or imprisoned to the idea that you have to stay somewhere for 20 years and, and make it work. Um, I think they're open to opportunities. They say, look, you know, I, five years, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to try something else. And I think that's fabulous because that doesn't mean that you don't love the art form. You can still come watch performances. You can still become a physical therapist. You can still design. You can still contribute to the art form. You don't necessarily have to do it on stage. And that kind of information now, I think, has made the dancer different. If you know what I'm saying? One of the reasons that I, that I stopped is because I was offered this kind of summer position with um, Channel 4 WNBC in New York to cover the first Lincoln Center Arts Festival. And it was kind of at the time when I really wanted to stop already. I'd done 24 years and I had already been thinking that I wanted to move on to something else. And so I grabbed it. I said, I'm going to do this and I'll do it for eight weeks uh, and then I'll just see where I am. And um, I sort of, kind of, maybe not really enjoyed it, but it, it was an escape for me. It was a chance to get out. So I took it and I did that for two years. I freelanced with them and I really just hated it. Um, you know, and it wasn't, I, it wasn't that I, I had to dance. It, it was just, I just knew that it wasn't the right place for me. And then I went on to teach quite a bit and kind of help put this school together and put um, um, a syllabus for them to kind of be, move from a, a a semi-professional to professional school and I did that for a few years and then um, Barbara Horgan which was Mr. Balanchine's right right hand like personal um, administrator asked me to head the Balanchine Foundation and at that point I really didn't I didn't have an idea what that meant and I said to her well at first I said no then I said yes and then I said no and then I said yes and then I said I'll only do it if I can spend the summer there kind of understanding what because I don't you know what's, I have no idea what that meant I had some some information about the non-for-profit world but um, so I did that for a summer and I thought you know let me just it was such a small uh, foundation it was only two people and um, very few projects that it was really this perfect kind of you know um, on the job training so I did that for about three years, three or four years, through the Balanchine Centennial. And then I had, um, then I kind of wanted to stop, but there were a lot of personal issues with my parents and things, and I had to travel home a lot because they were ill, and, and I just couldn't quite keep the two things going, so I, I left that. Um, and then um, I remember there was um, a message that came from Alicia Lonzo, the, from the the Cuban ballerina, and um, I think she kind of views me as her daughter because I'm Cuban and I dance. And, and she sent me a message through a friend of mine saying, "You know, you've um, you've got to go back to dance. You've got to you've got to be able to you've got to contribute to the art form 
what it gave to you. And, and, it, and it, she was absolutely right. She goes, the art form needs it, which is why I believe that, you know, when you stop dancing, you should give back to it in whether it's teaching or rehearsing or, or putting, you know, computer programs for it or wh whatever it is, but you, to be around it again and to contribute to it. And that's really what made me think, gee, you know, maybe I should kind of start to think this way, you know, be open to po uh, possibilities coming my way. And literally, it was, it was a few months later that Chris um, called me from London and said, I have this idea, and, you know, we'd been kind of, he'd been kind of talking about it for a while. And, we sat down and I said, well, let's, let's just do it.